uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, it's not nearly as nice as the last uh, occasion uh, when Lev was here and uh, we celebrated 50 years of the Gorkoff equation. And at that time, Al Migliore had taken some photographs of a number of uh, sketches and paintings that uh, Lev had made. And Peter uh, Gorkoff had put them together in a book uh, that uh, this uh, is one picture in. That book was called Illustrations to Life. And this is called Merry Dragons and it's uh, uh, 1977. And again, uh, Chandra sh showed some of Lev's sketching, but in this book, there are a number of uh, uh, very marvelous pictures that Lev made. And I am afraid if he were here for my talk, he would be busy sketching something else over there, which is, I think, what he did uh, to pass the time of talks. Uh, I met Lev uh, in the late 60s. Uh, there was, in 1966, there was a low temperature physics conference uh, in Moscow, and somehow it was probably a year or two later uh, that there was a group of us uh, with David Pines and Bob Schrieffer that went there. And uh, I think that was the time I at least had a chance to talk with Lev as people have been speaking uh, about Lev. Lev was a very warm person, but to a young, well, to a person who didn't know him, uh, I, I say young, he was young then too, but to a person who didn't know him, he was very imposing, and of course his work was very imposing. So uh, what I felt able to talk to him about on that second visit uh, was an electromagnetic matching problem. We were, uh, Langenberg and Taylor and I were trying to see Josephson radiation coming out of a Josephson junction and of course the impedance match coming out of this junction that uh, I don't know 10, 20 angstroms and you're trying to match it into an X-band guide uh, was a tricky problem but I had been an experimentalist for five years at Stanford and worked with microwaves and so I was busy trying to calculate this but was having a great deal of trouble and somehow I had the uh, temerity to, as Levin, I sat at one point, he said, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm uh, calculating the impedance match between a Josephson junction and uh, X-band waveguide. And to my delight, uh, Lev wanted to talk about it. He not only wanted to talk about it, uh, I'm not sure whether it was possibly radar work during the war or what, but he had some uh, very useful suggestions about what was an impedance match problem uh, that uh, we were able to talk about. At any rate, uh, this is called Merry Dragons, as I said, and now let's see whether we can go. What I want to talk about is a system where I'm imagining that spin fluctuations are driving uh, the pairing and I'd like to know how TC depends upon the Q and omega structure of those spin fluctuations. Uh, it was work with Thomas Dom. It's partly motivated by experimental work by Dean et al. on some lanthanum strontium copper oxide samples where what they found was uh, with RICS that the magnon spectrum was broadening as they doped it, but that uh, the spin fluctuations weren't going away. They were changing their Q and omega structure, but they weren't going away. Nevertheless, TC was going to zero. And so the question was, you know, what's happened here? How? And they talked about why it wasn't certain effects they had found, but that in fact, maybe it was a redistribution of spectral weight. So that's what this talk is about. Now, we have to go back in time uh, because this was already, this question was already addressed for the electron phonon system as it was addressed by Bergman and Rainier, who wanted to understand the sensitivity of TC to alpha squared F omega. 
And so they calculated the functional derivative of TC with respect to alpha squared F omega, and I want to tell you a little about that. Uh, they began with the ely oshberg equations, uh, which, as we know, depend upon an average of phonon squared matrix element and a phonon uh, Green's function that tells you about the phonon fluctuations, and of course, on mu star. All right, so uh, if I could do this right. This is at a time when there's very beautiful tunneling data by John Rao, and Bill McMillan has come along, and they've set up ely oshberg like equations that uh, we heard a little about more this morning, and they've uh, taken uh, the DIV, DV characteristics uh, and uh, extracted the gap and Z. And clearly, this is a tricky calculation. You've got real and imaginary parts of delta and real imaginary parts of Z, and you're trying to extract them from this. Nevertheless, they were very successful. Bill McMillan uh, writing a uh, ingenious program to do this, and they pulled out this alpha squared F omega, and it has details on it. It has uh, Van Hove uh, singularity pieces. It has Umklop uh, piece right there, I think, and it has a shape of transverse and longitudinal phonons. Okay. Now, given this, the question came about, uh, Bergman and Rainier asked this question. What parts of this spectrum are uh, important for TC. And they asked it in this uh, functional way, which said, suppose you came in to the alpha squared F omega, and you simply cut out a small section and removed it. How would that change TC? Well, it would reduce TC. They used uh, the ely oshberg form I talked about and did this calculation. And the uh, calculation was therefore of the functional derivative, uh, the small region you pulled it out, and what weight, and that would give you somehow how TC was depleted, and you could then tell what parts of the spectrum were important. Uh, and indeed, for lead using uh, Raoul McMillan tunneling data, they found that the functional derivative rose up until it got around 4 milli electron volts for lead. Uh, that's, I think, if I remember right, perhaps three times, four times the gap. But several times the gap you want to get up above this. And then there was a 1 over omega decay. And this suggested where you might want your spin fluctuations. And sure enough, in lead, there were the transverse and longitudinal spin fluctuations. You could look at this and ask questions such as, what if you could dope this, maybe with bismuth, or you could change it in some way so as to move spectral weight out of here, down there, could you raise the TC? And so there were things going on of this type to try and understand four materials that were electron phonon in nature. Uh, what if you changed that spectral weight, okay? Uh, about 10 years later, John Rowell is visiting Stanford and uh, Ted Jabal and his group are very interested in niobium germanium. They'd like to get the uh, niobium-3 germanium-1 uh, concentration to get a higher, to get a good TC film. <clears throat> that particular mix isn't stable, but they found that by uh, evaporating and quenching films, they could make films that had, uh, what? different compositions of niobium germanium. And so uh, they wanted to know, what if you could move that spectral weight around? What would happen? Well, they didn't have uh, delta TC alpha squared F omega for niobium-3 germanium, but they had it for niobium-310. And thought was, well, this will look somewhat like that. So they went on, and here happens to be a germanium 16%. So this is way off of the 3-1, uh, uh, niobium-3, germanium-1 uh, concentration. But with John Rowell there, they set in motion the 
Macmillan and Rao program, and they pulled out alpha squared F omega, and this happened to be for a seven degree film. Then they went on and made a film much closer to the uh, uh, structure that they were after, and indeed the alpha squared F omega peaked up, it was larger, it shifted down, and uh, uh, with that they were up at uh, 20 degrees Kelvin. So indeed, this is a process where if you had the ability to measure alpha squared F omega and you did this functional derivative, you uh, didn't do it, you could try and understand what you might want to do to move the spectral weight to an optimal spot for superconductivity. Okay, now <clears throat> what I want to tell you about is a calculation Thomas Dom has done. He's done it for a model in which the uh, uh, gap equation is driven not by phonons, but is driven by spin fluctuations. Uh, uh, this uh, is the gap equation, this is the self-energy equation, and again, we plan to solve those two equations. Consistent with what? Well, consistent with an input coming from experiment or uh, it happens to be YBCO 6.6. .6. So uh, with that, the question is, what is that functional derivative? So in this case, suppose you take a uh, spin fluctuation, uh, inelastic neutron scattering data for this, and you add a delta function, only this time you're gonna do it in both frequency and momentum to find out where uh, you would like to add fluctuations, uh, if, and of course this is an if, we heard talks earlier today that certainly question this, but if the system, uh, YBCO, is b driven by spin fluctuations, uh, and if you're willing to use the kind of uh, flex theory I drew out there, and you put experimental data in, can you calculate this functional derivative, and that's, uh, pardon me, and if you do, uh, what we'll be calculating is, uh, what I'll show you is the functional derivative of the eigenvalue. That eigenvalue goes to one when you're at TC. So its, its functional derivative is very closely related to what you want. There's just a factor that divides it that doesn't do much to it. So we'll be calculating this change of eigenvalue. Okay, so therefore within this framework, uh, like Bergman and Rainier did for lead, we're going to try and do it for YBCO 6.6 .6 and ask, where do you want the spin fluctuations? We know where they are, but where might you want them? And so here's where they are. This is work uh, in elastic neutron scattering by Hinkoff, uh, Keimer, and others. And this is a plot going uh, along the diagonal. So this is qx equals qy, I'm going out along to the pi pi point, and this is data at 70 Kelvin. This particular material, 6.6, .6, has a transition temperature of 61 Kelvin. So we're up above Tc, and you can see there is a spin gap in this material, and there's a lot of weight down around this uh, 40 MeV and extends out along these lines. So the question is, what if you now do this calculation I described, what do you find for the functional derivative of this eigenvalue that goes to one when you're at TC? So uh, I think it's fair to think of this plot as the functional derivative of TC with respect to changes in the inelastic tunneling uh, spectrum. And what does this say? Uh, let me fix Flick to the next graph. What it says is something we knew from Millis, uh, Subir, and Chandra, which is if you were, uh, yeah, you have to watch this. This is actually saying, uh, there's a sign in here, and, and what this is saying is if you put spin fluctuations in to a certain region, what would it do to TC? If you put them in in this region, region, 
It does bad things to TC, and this is known. It was known from this paper. They pair break, and so that's bad for TC. On the other hand, if you go up above uh, this region, particularly in this region where you are, if you go into this region, it's uh, uh, helpful for TC. And let's take a couple of slices that are a little easier to see. If you happen to stay in the Brillouin zone along the pi pi, pi uh, uh, direction, and you cut, uh, pardon me, you are at pi pi, a momentum transfer of pi pi, and you look at it as a function of frequency, you see this behavior of at low frequency, it's pair breaking, and it would suppress TC. On the other hand, once you get up above it, this is the sweet spot, and this will drop off like one over omega. This is another cut. This is a cut on the edge. You're now at a smaller momentum of order 0.6 pi, 0.6 pi. In that region, you can see, although it's a bit hard on this graph, that it's gone dark. You're not doing much. If you were to move further out this way, you'd see red. And what that's telling you is you have small enough momentum that you're scattering from where the gap has one sign to where it has the same sign. And since you have a repulsive intera uh, a positive interaction, that will reduce TC. Uh, in fact, uh, for large momentum, this uh, functional derivative has a rather simple form. It goes like cosine Q over omega. So it's dying out at larger omega, and you don't want small momentum transfer uh, if you want to help TC. OK, now let's see where we are. So now you can imagine, you can take uh, and take a look at what happens if you take the inelastic uh, neutron scattering data of Hinkoff at 70 Kelvin, and now you lay it in to get just an idea of what's happening with respect to where it could help you. And what you see is, within this model, what's helping you are low-lying spin fluctuations. They, of course, continue up. This is just the weight of the spin fluctuations. And this gives you an idea of what's happening with momentum transfer. All right. Now, you could do something else. It happens that Hinkoff had uh, neutron scattering data on this same sample, but down at 5 Kelvin. So by the time you get down to 5 Kelvin, the uh, neutron scattering has become much more intense. This is the spin resonance. Uh, and uh, it, you begin to see the curved branches coming down. Now, you can imagine, and or you could ask yourself, what if you actually had that uh, chi of Q omega spectrum up near TC? What would happen? So that's what this plot is showing. It's, it's a multiplication of this times this uh, response uh, that's been calculated. and. Uh, if you then integrate that out, you'll find a coupling constant that is not 1, but that's at about uh, 1.5. And you say, what does that mean? Uh, it doesn't mean very much physically, because you can't get there. But what it should mean is that if you could, as you drop below TC, because of the rearrangement of the spin fluctuations, as the gap opens up, the resonance develops. That particular rearrangement of the structure is very favorable to TC. And if you could only get that up at TC, you could have a higher TC. That's what, at least, that's the interpretation within this. Uh, yeah, now, is there any indication that's true? Well, again, depends what you believe. But if you were to just take a D-wave superconductor, and ask what the two delta over KT, uh, delta zero is the maximum gap of the D wave. 
Tudor asked what 2 delta over KTC is. It's about 4.31, as I remember, within BCS. On the other hand, uh, if you take the strength of the pairing that you have at low temperature, as I said, you get an enhancement about 50% uh, of what you would expect on the TC. If then you do that, uh, you would then start predicting a 2 delta over KTC that is larger, and in fact, the measured one is larger. Now, ideally, what one would like is a situation where you have a knob on the system that would allow you to change the spin fluctuation spectrum and at the same time monitor what's happening in the TC. In a way, that's the first paper I showed you, the lanthanum strontium copper oxide. They're changing the doping in that. They have Rick's inelastic spectrum, so they have chi on this. And if the functional derivative were to be done for that, which we've not done, then you could imagine trying to feed in this different data to see if, in fact, the TC is dropping off in the way you would uh, predict. We haven't done that. All we have so far is the YBCO 6.6. Thanks. We have time for some questions. Like about very last slides, the ones that you have now. It says that 2 delta over TC increases uh, because he, there is a redistribution of spin fluctuation spectral weight below TC, right? Well, sorry. I picked this one point out. Just sure, sure, sure. To, just, yeah. just, mm -hmm. sorry, just to get this data. I picked this point out because this is the YBCO. It happens to be the 6.6 60 mm. Kelvin TC. So I just picked that out to get that. I think if you look at other high TC materials, quite often you'll find the 2 delta over KTC, 2 delta maximum at zero, at low temperatures mm -hmm. over KTC is larger than the sure. BCS value. And the argument here would be that's occurring because the pairing interaction is actually getting stronger as you go into the superconducting state. And my question in this regard, suppose you have a spin fluctuation, experimental spin fluctuation spectrum at TC or slightly above TC. What happens if you solve nonlinear equation for delta without taking redistribution of spin fluctuation spectral weight into consideration? Did you try this to see what, what two delta over TC you would get? I mean, uh, that, uh, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, no, and that would be, uh, sorry, that would be a good thing to do. What we did do was simply calculate the uh, beta saltpeter eigenvalue. And as I said, that went f from about 1, because we're at 70 Kelvin, so we're near the transition. It went from about 1 to about 1.5. In other words, there's, clearly it knows there's an enhancement coming. Now, how, qua how quantitative it is, that's another matter. Here is Doug, I haven't been following this story as closely as I should have. In the experiments, do they see any redistribution of uh, fluctuation weight in momentum as you go out to overdoping? Uh, okay, let's go. I, I should have shown that slide, Peter. I didn't bring it. Uh, in the work uh, by, I think it's the Brookhaven group, using samples, uh, Ivan Bozovic samples, I think, on lanthanum, strontium, copper oxide. What they see as they overdope that is they see a strong redistribution in momentum. The main thrust of their article is they don't see the spin fluctuations go away, but they see them change. Now, they change in such a way that they move away from large momentum transfer to smaller momentum transfer. And there's a paper by uh, Tom Devereaux and his group and myself in which we don't do the functional integral, but we calculate the effective coupling strength. And indeed, you see it drop, even though the Rick spectrum is still showing that you have spin fluctuations. And it's dropping much as the uh, Brookhaven group said in their abstract, because of a redistribution of the spectral weight. At least that's what I believe. Uh, Doug, uh, in this 6.6 uh, .6 example, what Delta knot did you use? Because I think in this underdope materials, 
the uh, D wave is not really D wave, right? It, ah. It's uh, there's a kink, and the gap goes up abruptly near the uh, anti node, and so it doesn't fit this uh, D wave form. So maybe I should remove this slide. I don't know what to say. I don't have an answer for that, Patrick. What I really don't have, and what I now, as I started to give the talk, realize I wish I had, I wish we had taken and simply used the uh, form we have. Uh, sorry, let me find it. Uh, go the other way. Uh, now, now we're lost. Uh, simply use this form on the lanthanum strontium copper oxide data because there we have experimental data. It's above TC, mm -hmm. and it's for a sequence of samples that are doped, and you clearly see that chi double prime of Q omega is changing. Mm -hmm. Now, question, what if you feed it into this? What sort of change do you see, say, in the uh, coupling eigenvalue? That's the sort of thing you could look at. Even there, uh, you know, if you didn't believe this story, I don't know as you would believe that either. So it's not proof of things. It's uh, perhaps, from my point of view, consistency. There have been other kinds of calculations uh, which, uh, which claim that Superconducting transition temperatures are negligible from antiferromagnetic fluctuations if the correlation length is uh, less than five or six lattice constants. And uh, as I understand you today, you are saying, you're saying about the same thing. Is that correct? Uh, I think what's correct is I'm saying that if you take the inelastic neutron scattering data, and you feed it in there as Dom and Hinkoff and various of us did, you then have another parameter that I have not talked about, which is the coupling parameter, three halves u squared, that you can get a TC that looks about right. Now as to your question, how long a coherence length are we talking about? We're talking about a very short one, I believe, because the dominant interaction that drives the spin fluctuations that I'm thinking about is short range, almost at a near neighbor scale. I can just look at this data, right? And I can tell that the correlation length at 6.6 .6 is about three lattice constants. I think it's smaller. Yeah, it's smaller. I it was about three or four. And no, I think one lattice constant maybe two. At optimal doping. Okay. It's smaller, maybe. Yeah. So that and, should help and, your argument. And what you showed in a very nice calculation that uh, BTC D omega in certain range is repulsive uh, except for uh, Q very close to the antiferromagnetic Bragg vector. Uh, not that close, Shannon. What I showed was something that was out to about 0.6. Yeah. On either side was this green sweet spot. And, and that was where the spectrum was rising. Correlation length around there is, as let's say very, let's say very optimistically, four lattice constants, <laughs> probably two and a half or three. So, isn't your calculation more or less proving that these things, let's say this compound, I don't know about, uh, we can talk about lanthanum copper oxide separately, but isn't your calculation really, uh, aren't you really claiming that spin fluctuations could not possibly be driving superconductivity in 0.6? I think Steve will answer. I don't know. Okay. Uh, what, I, I'm not. I'm not claiming that because what I actually, what I actually, I should have added more about this calculation. This calculation uses ARPA's data to get an effective uh, band structure, quasi-particle Green's function for this. It uses uh, the self-energy I showed you to broaden it and it uses the gap equation along with the input being inelastic neutron scattering data. So this is not a flex calculation. We haven't looped this calculation and tried to make it uh, give us all the pieces. We've tried to go to the experimental data 
and take what it gives us. And that data generator may well have a chi double prime of Q omega that speaks of a situation where the correlation length in that data would tell you it's several lattice spacings at most. I believe it is. Nevertheless, you feed that into this, and this is what you get if you believe to start the framework, you should use a spin fluctuation like framework or flex, like calculation. But the quantities going in it are not self consistently calculated, they're pulled from experiment. I, I just was going to say you have actually a somewhat a quantitative answer to his question. The width. I wish I could find it. No, so the width of the sweet spot, the region where you're getting an enhancement, is about, I guess, root 2 times 0.1 reciprocal lattice vectors, yeah. which corresponds to a correlation length of like two lattice constants. So the region, anything that's sharper than that is overkill from your point of view. You can't see it, but Steve is talking about the width of this. So I think it's a good time to uh, thank the speaker once more and to move on.